guys look like. Okay. All right. Uh, hello, everyone. Welcome to the YSU alumni lecture series. My name is Randy McAvoy. I am a junior music composition student here at the Dana School of Music at YSU, and I will be the moderator this evening. Tonight, we are going to be talking about the Muse series, a uh, performing arts series being hosted by the McDonough Museum of Art, and I am joined by Claudia Berlinski and Dr. Kivi Khan Lipman. Claudia Berlinski has been teaching art at YSU for 20 years, where she has served as the Foundations Program Coordinator and Assistant to the Chair in the Department of Art. She is also the Director of the John J. McDonough Museum of Art on campus. She exhibits nationally and regionally, contributes to print portfolio exchanges, and curates and educates group exhibitions. Her work is included in collections across the nation. Dr. Kivi Khan Lippin holds degrees from Oberlin, Juilliard, and the University of Cincinnati. Praised in the New York Times for his versatility, he is the founding cellist of the International Contemporary Ensemble, as well as founder and lyrinist of the Baroque String Group, acronym, and gombist with the Viol Consort Lestrange. Kivi appears on more than 50 recordings with many record labels, and a recent review in the New York Times notes that his long flowing hair often covers his face as he plays. Seriously, the New York Times printed that. All right, welcome to both of you. How are you both doing tonight? Great. Great, thanks for having us. Yeah, thanks for being here. Well, first, I'd love to start with a clip from the most recent uh, performance in the Muse series, uh, featuring the Dana Piano Trio, which consists of Dr. Khan Lippmann on cello, Dr. Cecilia Yuda on piano, and Dr. Wendy Case on violin. And this clip um, from their recent performance back on August 30th of this year um, is a clip from the piece uh, by Arvo Pert called Mozart Adagio, and it's a reimagining of one of Mozart's slower movements for one of his famous works. That video was a little bit laggy, so maybe we can see after after we stream, see if we can include the uh, links to each one of these clips in the video description, so that way you can listen to it afterwards. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Sounds good. All right, well, Claudia, let's start with you. Um, let's talk a little bit about the Muse series. What is it? Uh, where does it take place? And why did why did you want to start this series? Well, so we describe the Muse uh, series as uh, featuring innovative expressions of contemporary culture, serving to enrich Northeast Ohio with recitals of groundbreaking new music and dynamic collaborations. So um, we have the recitals take place at the McDonough Museum of Art, and it is a partnership between the Dana School of Music and the McDonough Museum of Art. Since we're really part of the same college, the Cliff College, there was sort of this desire to create more partnerships than there already are within the college. Um, you know, there is certainly the partnership between Dana School of Music and theater department and theater and, you know, and dance are one. And so um, we thought we have this space. Could we have musical performances in there? And it turns out that when I reached out to uh, Dana School of Music that um, there were a number of eager people, um, performers who were looking for a new space to perform in. And so um, we decided to create this series. And, um, and really the Dana School of Music kind of takes a lead in, in um, you know, finding the performers, putting together the recitals, and we provide the space. Um, <laughs> We provide the space and great art, you know, so so that was one of the reasons um, that we thought it would be a really good partnership because um, a lot of the music recitals deal with contemporary music, although there is some 
um, historical classical music as well. And we're a contemporary art center. And so what a better combination than to, you know, have something to look at while you're listening. And, and uh, so, so, you know, there were things to work out, but um, it, it's really coming along and we've had um, three or four performances in the series so far. And uh, so we're really just at the beginning um, of this, this project. What's which has a lot that? of potential, I think. Yeah, I agree. So you, I know you said Dana is up, you leave it up to Dana uh, for the most part to determine who you want to perform. So Kivi, how, how do you decide which performances to include in such a dynamic series like this? We've been focused so far on classical contemporary music, uh, on bringing new works of music to, to the museum while it's displaying new works of art. Uh, and, but we're open to really all kinds of music. It's such a beautiful acoustic to play in. It's such a beautiful room to play in uh, that right now it's uh, whatever is available, uh, whatever Dana is producing, uh, faculty, students, guest artists, uh, it's, all, it's all open to become part of the Muse series. That's wonderful, yeah. I know we had we had another clip. Um, speaking of faculty artists, uh, we did have a clip of Dr. Catherine Umble, uh, accompanied by Anthony Ruggiero from a recital that she held as part of the Muse series. I don't know if maybe you think it would be best just to include the link so that we don't have to worry about the sharing that video. <laughs> so, know. do you now should I try to share it, or was it really bad the first one? I don't think it came through that. I, I don't think it does it justice when we share it. Okay. So okay. We'll, we'll include the links afterwards, but she plays a, um, the clip is a selection from a piece called Sweet Florentine by Charles Marie Vidor. And this was from her recital that she held as part of the Muse series on January 25th of this year. Um, so can, so can I just interject something? Um, so with Catherine's um, performance, um, we had an installation, a sculptural installation in that particular gallery. So that wasn't just a freestanding sculpture here or there, but it was this um, this thing, many things that hung from the ceiling and were kind of moving around like mobiles in the middle of the space and actually uh, even around the periphery a little bit. And so when um, I, I think that um, the she and, and Anthony were both a little surprised when they came into the space. Um, but Anthony was so um, enthusiastic about it. He really won Catherine's heart over. And, um, and, and it was really, I think, dynamic because, you know, with the airflow, the mobiles were kind of moving around slowly. And, and Catherine and Anthony were really kind of part of the installation. And uh, so, so I thought it was kind of great to have that, not just art hanging on the walls, but sort of this collaboration between, literally between the art and the performers. Sort of just all in one syncretic experience. Yeah, That's yeah. That's you, can, if it, uh, you can see it a little bit in the videos, of course, the little clip. That's wonderful, yeah. I'll be sure to take another look at that. Um, so, Kivi, you, men you mentioned before that you try to focus on contemporary classical music. So, what exactly is that genre? Could you kind of give a little more of a description? How would you yeah, define that? It's a great question, and it's, uh, it's a term that doesn't have a really clear definition. It's sort of been morphing. Um, but if we were to sort of create a, um, a somewhat subjective binary between art music and pop music, and then another one between recent music and music of the past, and then another one between music written for classical acoustic instruments and other instruments. Uh, classical contemporary music is simply art music that's been written recently for classical instruments. Um, and that uh, there's a wide variety of styles and sounds that that can entail. Uh, but all of that sort of gets, um, can be wrapped up uh, and described as classical contemporary music. Yeah. When you say recent, I mean, I know we're making subjective binaries here, but when you say recent, like you're talking like maybe the last 40 years, the last 30 years? How it's funny. It depends on who you're talking to. Uh, you can look at 
uh, you can look at some audition lists for professional auditions and they'll say a contemporary piece written since 1900 or since 1945, which by, you know, obviously that's not contemporary, but that still feels contemporary to a lot of, uh, to a lot of audience members and even to a lot of uh, professional classical musicians who don't play a lot of music from the 20, from the 20th century, let alone the 21st century. Um, I, when I think of contemporary music, I'm usually thinking of 21st century music, the last 15 to 20 years. Okay. You mentioned that musicians and audiences don't necessarily have this sort of, you know, there's the bit of a disconnect. They view it like anything within the last century or so is contemporary. Do you think that there are other like preconceived notions that audiences or even other performers of music have with this sort of, you know, with this genre? Yeah, I think audiences, when they think classical music, um, they think something something beautiful and old fashioned. They think Mozart and Beethoven. Um, and uh, there's such a wide variety of styles that make up classical contemporary. And some of it, um, some of it does sound like that. You get uh, you get beautiful melodies and harmonies. Um, and a lot of it, it doesn't. We've, we've got noise music. We've got music that's been randomized. Um, there's 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 so much going on within uh, within classical contemporary music, and I think audiences are sometimes not expecting, uh, not prepared for what they're going to hear, and that's been the case for for a long time. Um, it's it's been inaccessible, I think, to a lot of audiences um, going back a hundred years, uh, mm -hmm. when composers who are long dead were the contemporary composers. Yeah. So even though not all audiences, you know, have the chance to interact with it a lot, you, on, on the other hand, have definitely been immersed in this sort of culture. So what have you, what have your experience has been um, with this genre of music and this style? Um, so like, like most people, like most musicians, uh, I, I grew up um, happily ignorant that any such thing existed. Um, I, I was training to be a professional classical musician, and I thought Stravinsky and Prokofiev, um, who are early 20th century composers writing in a really old fashioned style, uh, I thought they were way out there. I didn't realize there was anything more modern than that. I, I basically didn't know that there were living classical composers of art music. Um, and then I went to college and I met a bunch of them. Uh, composition majors at Oberlin became uh, most of my best friends in college, uh, and I became their pet cellist. Uh, so I, I spent I spent most of my twenties uh, really sort of specializing in this uh, in this kind of music, um, and a lot of my most profound experiences as a performer have been when I've been able to work with composers uh, and help them create and shape the piece. Um, and this was a lot of what I was doing in New York before I got this job and moved to Youngstown. Uh, and I teach at a festival every summer in in Tuscany that's focused on classical contemporary music. Uh, there are uh, there's several faculty composers, one of them, Forrest Pierce, uh, who's a dear friend of mine, teaches at University of Kansas at Lawrence. Uh, I was able to bring him uh, to Youngstown uh, for a concert on the Muse series last, uh, last November or December. I think we, you know, you're right. I think we do have a clip of one of the pieces that we played on his recital. Um, tell us a little more about it, uh, the All Night Vigil. Uh, a piece for yes. solo cello and women's choir. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, uh, the piece is called The All Night Vigil of Rabia Aladakwia. I think I'm probably butchering the pronunciation of her name, and I apologize for that. Um, she was an, an eighth century Sufi mystic uh, in uh, what's uh, modern day Iraq. Um, and she would, uh, she would have these all night vigils on her rooftop and record the visions that she had, um, and there's a, a modern translation, uh, I think also by someone who teaches at University of Kansas and a friend of the composer Horace Pierce, and uh, together they, they created this work that's uh, 13 visions of Rabia, um, and the cello is sort of the, um, uh, the cello sort of holds everything together, uh, and this women's choir uh, sings each of the visions, sometimes with solos, sometimes uh, homophonically as a unit. Um, it's a really beautiful piece. That's wonderful. Um, and I, I think we have an excerpt of it. I have no idea if it will, if it will, how it's going to sound if you 
try playing it. I don't know if it's worth doing that. I can try it if you want me to, but it'll probably be the same quality as the original one. Yeah, we're not having great luck over WebEx tonight. Yeah, it, it really it was quite beautiful with the voice, uh, you know, the choir. Um, yeah. So. Well, we can share. We can share a link. It sounds like in the in the chat after. Definitely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, just to give some more information, uh, it's Forrest Pierce's piece called "The All Night Vigil," um, and it was performed as part of the Muse series on December first of twenty nineteen, uh, featuring Dr. Con Lippman on cello and a women's choir comprised of Dana um, vocal students and a couple professors, uh, and it was conducted by Anna Marco uh, as part of the uh, as part of the series. So outside of pieces like that, where you've gotten to collaborate with composers in that sort of, you know, intimate, like really friendship kind of sense, what other, what other pieces have you played or participated in that have kind of impacted you the most? Um, I guess the, the pieces that have impacted me the most, it, it's changed a lot over time. Um, I used to get most excited by works that, um, they're sort of now broadly classified as the, the, the post-war avant-garde. Um, and these are the great composers of uh, really the late 1940s through the 80s or 90s. Um, and, and some of you who are, who are watching this might know some of these names, even if you're not really familiar with this music. Uh, Pierre Boulez uh, became a, a very well-known conductor, but he was a composer and uh, first, sort of one of the original bad boys of classical contemporary music. Um, Yanis Dinakis uh, is a Greek uh, composer who uh, studied with Messiaen in France, but is actually in many circles better known as an architect. He was Corbusier's assistant and actually claimed that most of Corbusier's ideas were his. Uh, Georgi Ligeti, um, who, uh, if you've seen 2001 A Space Odyssey, he wrote um, a lot of the most famous music to that. Um, although he didn't write it for the film, he wrote it as concert pieces and then Kubrick uh, grabbed the music for the film and Ligeti didn't even know that it was going to be used in the film until he went to the theater and saw it. Um, anyway, the, I, I loved those guys, and those were my biggest influences um, when I was a student. Uh, they're all uh, dead white European men now, and their style's really kind of old-fashioned uh, compared to what's happening in the music scene today. Um, so I've got a bunch of new favorites from the last, uh, from the last 10, 20 years. Uh, one of my favorite composers uh, who I've gotten to work with, uh, Caroline Shaw, uh, wrote a piece called Partita for Eight Voices um, that won a Pulitzer a few years back. Um, if you've seen the uh, the, the German sci-fi show Dark on Netflix, uh, that's that featured prominently in it. Um, Kaya Sariaho is a Finnish composer. Um, her opera La Mort de Loen is uh, was it played at the Met um, a year or two ago. I think it's the most sumptuous thing ever written. I love it. Um, there's an American composer, Kate Soper, who wrote a piece uh, called Voices from the Killing Jar, which really blows me away. There's a lot of great contemporary classical music being written right now. That's wonderful. So why do you think it's important for audiences to listen to more of this and kind of support it through series like the Muse series? Um, well, there was a study done pretty recently by the League of American Orchestras, which is an organization of about 60 of the most prominent American symphony orchestras. Um, and they were looking at what pieces were getting performed, what composers were getting performed. Uh, and they found that uh, of the 2,700 something pieces uh, performed by major orchestras that year, or of the 2,700 something performances that year, only 75 included any classical contemporary music. It was like, like I think it was 2.9%. Um, and the, the result when that happens, when all the major symphony orchestras are basically ignoring music of the last several generations, is that um, classical music sort of gets relegated to, um, it, it's, a, it's the most old fashioned museum possible. Um, and it's even worse because up until the most recent generation or two, there were no non-white composers. There were almost no women composers. Um, it means that classical music is has it's become a celebration of dead white guys, and it's and it's a problem. Um, and the Muse series and other organizations that are focused on classical contemporary music um, are doing what we can to correct this um, and to showcase uh, other voices. Um, 
I think also it's really important as, as a human to be challenged by the unfamiliar. Um, and uh, hearing music in a style that you've, that you've never heard is one way to, is one way to do that. And uh, even if you leave hating it, you've, you've gained something from the experience. And hopefully you won't hate it. <laughs> hopefully. Claudia, what do you think, what, what can there be gained by attending series like the Muse series where they combine contemporary classical music with contemporary art? What, what is there for people to gain from you know, well, experiencing different, more, more modern, I should say, pieces of art? I think it helps to uh, foster or continues to foster the relationship between the visual arts and the musical arts. And, um, you know, at the museum, we have, we're trying to develop all kinds of programming to bridge the different art disciplines and um, to help really make that connection for people who tend to, um, you know, categorize those and, and separate them. And I think that, you know, people who are interested in the McDonough Museum um, may come to a performance, a series performance, or another musical performance here, just because they are patrons of the museum, and, uh, and vice versa. There may be uh, people who are really interested in the Dana School of Music and music in general, classical music, and it may be their first time in the museum here or their second time, and so it really helps to build audiences for both of our disciplines and um, and I think that it provides for the community, um, you know, this, I don't want to say a more casual experience, but it's not, you're not going to a place like Stambaugh Auditorium, for example, or the Dior Center um, to see an orchestral performance, but you're in, um, you know, a, an art gallery. And I think it, it, creates a different sort of experience, um, you know, when the lights aren't dimmed and you can see what's going on around you and and um, look at the art while you're listening to music. And um, I think that that's a unique experience in this area in particular for the community. Definitely. And I can even say from my own experience, um, participating in student composition recitals, um, that aren't even a part of this Muse series, but have still taken place in the McDonough Gallery. It's such a wonderful, unique experience. Like you said, to play somewhere where the lights aren't dimmed and like the audience and the performers are so close to each other and right. separated by this stage and, you know, physical distance and everything. And, but instead in the McDonough, they're right up close and you can see, you can almost see the sheet music. So it's, it's a really fascinating experience, I think. And like you said, to be surrounded by art at the same time, it's just this multifaceted experience of contemporary culture that it's hard to find in other places like concert halls, I think. Yeah, and um, when Forrest Pierce uh, performance was going on, we had the BFA exhibition, which is the culminating um, exhibition for the, the art students who are graduating. And so, you know, I think that's a, a special experience too, to have the student work showcased and have people come in and see that who may not have otherwise come in. Um, and to see, we had the choir standing in front of this huge 20 foot wall of like double decker, five foot paintings that were done by a student. It was quite lovely. Yeah, wonderful. So what, what do you foresee in the in the future, both you know, short term and long term, for this Muse series, what do you, what do you want the, what do you want the series to become? I know you said it's still kind of new. We've only had a couple performances so far, um, but what are some goals that we have uh, for you know gaining more audiences or future collaborations that we'd love to see? Um, what are some ideas that we have? Well, we'd love to have Kivi's uh, ensemble play here, right? <laughs> Wouldn't we? <laughs> I mean, I know he's performed, you know, with, you know, Forrest and, and uh, with the Dana Piano Trio, but with his other outside um, ensembles. That'd be great. Um, right now we're in such a difficult place because of course COVID is canceling basically all live indoor performances for audiences. Um, and we can't bring in guest artists this school year. Um, so the new series is really relying on faculty performances, which are going to be live streamed. 
Uh, and on, on October 14th, uh, the Dana Cano Trio will perform a piece by uh, Kaya Sariaho, the, the Finnish composer I mentioned earlier, one of my favorites. Uh, and we're going to also include a piece by Beethoven to celebrate uh, his 250th anniversary year. Um, and later on the school year, we'll be back with, uh, with other colleagues. Um, and uh, there, there'll be a concert at the end of the semester of Dana student composers. Um, our dean had a vision for the Muse series, uh, which is that we'd be commissioning site-specific music that would ideally be created in collaboration with the visual artists whose works would be on display. Uh, and I think that's going to be an amazing experience for audience members once we're able to realize this. It might be might be a couple of years down the road, but that's an important goal, I think, for for the series. Right. I, I'm glad you brought that up because I was thinking about that as well. Um, yeah, so that uh, I think that will probably be a few years down the road, but yeah, so and that will take once we are able to find people who are able to work together, that will then take some time for them to to create the visual art and and the music. And so that could that could take on several different forms. There could be, you know, artwork that was already created that that um inspires the music or vice versa, or they could collaborate, you know, as a team and create both simultaneously. And then it would become an installation in the museum where the recorded um, music would be played, you know, inside of the art. And uh, so, yeah, that's very exciting. That's wonderful. So, Kitty, you mentioned there were some upcoming performances. You said the Dana Piano Trio will be on October 14th. Um, are there any other live streaming events that we have scheduled? Um, right now, there's nothing currently scheduled for the Muse series uh, past October 14th. We're, we're playing things a little bit by ear. We're, we're just because of there's so much in flux. Mm -hmm. um, we're not we're trying to avoid scheduling something and then have to have to cancel it, but we'll we'll let uh, we'll let our audiences know uh, a couple months out uh, when we've got something that's going to happen for sure, uh, and we'll try to schedule these every every couple months and expose as many people as possible to to different styles of music that they might never have heard before. Yeah, wonderful. So it's not it's pre-recorded. I just wanted to clarify that. So um, live streaming, as you can tell, can be difficult. Um, um, so we are pre-recording these, and um, in addition to the Muse series, we are having um, an alumni recital series and um, the student honors recital series. So almost every week we'll be in the museum recording some sort of um, musical performance that will then be found on the McDonough YouTube channel on the Cliff College YouTube channel. So. We have premiere dates set up for those, and and um, you can find that on the McDonough website. You can find information on the Facebook page, and and there will be events created that will be shared across, you know, the Cliff College Facebook, um, McDonough Facebook, and the Dana School of Music Facebook. If you're interested in that, it's as I, I there is nine in total, I think, of those um, performances. Wonderful. Oh, and don't let's not forget the composition class again. That was so fun um, last semester because the music, it was so varied, you know, and one ensemble would come up and play something very um, folksy and another one would come up and be more like contemporary classic and uh, it was wonderful. The variety of music being created today, um, even within the classical contemporary music, just within art music written for classical instruments, it's so, uh, there's just so much different stuff going on. Um, we have a lot of isms in, in classical music, uh, just like in the modern art world. Uh, some, of the, some of the same isms, uh, they, they, they correlate, like abstract expressionism, serialism, and, and minimalism. Uh, and we've got some of our own, like spectralism, that there's no art equivalent of that, I don't think. Um, and then we've got composers who are writing in styles uh, of 100 years ago, like Schoenberg, or 200 years ago, like uh, like like Beethoven or Schubert. Um, it's it's really exciting uh, how much stylistic variety there is. For sure, for sure. All right. Well, I think 
we've reached the point uh, in our discussion where we're open to taking any questions from our viewing audience uh, for live streams. Uh, I see we have one already in our chat uh, from Matt on Facebook. Uh, could you list some of your contemporary classical favorites? The ones you mentioned sound so intriguing. Um, so I don't know, Kivi, are there any other specific pieces that you'd love to mention or Claudia afterwards, if you have any favorites of your own that you've listened to? <laughs> <laughs> sure. I, uh, so I mentioned a few already. Um, the, the first one that comes to mind, just because uh, I listened to it again fairly recently, and it's always just so much fun, um, an Italian composer named Fausto Romatelli um, uh, wrote a piece called Professor Bad Trip. Um, and it's, um, I can't really describe what it sounds like. It's way out there. It's sort of um, like, electroacoustic acid spectralism. I, I just made up a, a thing. Um, From what I've heard of it, that seems to come pretty close. It's really cool. Uh, you can go on YouTube and um, you'll see the, uh, you'll, you'll see a set of recordings, uh, Professor Bad Trip Lessons 1, 2, and 3. Um, the recording by Ictus is really amazing. Um, I, had a, I had a class listen to that last semester once we went online. I, some of them, some of them really hated it. I do remember that there were some people who were not as as keen to it, but I mean that's the thing. Like you said, there are so many different styles that there really is something for everyone. Um, the more the more avant garde this music gets, um, the the fewer people I think it it might appeal to. It's like it's like anything avant. It's it's like avant garde film or avant garde food. Um, the the wackier something is, the, the the fewer people will appreciate it. You have to be the sort of person who. Um, seeks out avant-garde things, um, and and classical contemporary music can get really out there. Um, a lot of strange noises that a lot of pe that most people don't think of as as music, um, and we sometimes get reactions like um, th "this is ugly," and and sometimes it is uh, very deliberately, or um, "this is random," which sometimes it is very deliberately, uh, or "my kid could write that," which um, he could. Your kid couldn't write that. Sorry. Well, that that's across the board for all kinds of art, isn't isn't that true? Um, yeah. So, it and and sometimes um, art cannot be beautiful. Art has to be ugly. You know, it's a reflection of our times quite often. So, um, so that's an experience in and of itself. So. Um, so, Kivi, do you think it is uh, a bad idea to do some live music because of the? I think if the um, if the if we're if trying to play the clip that's already been pre sort of, I I, I could try, but I don't, I don't think it's going to work based on that little experience that we had so far <laughs> of just playing that clip. Okay. Um, yeah, WebEx is not. We're not necessarily on a system that's well designed for for live music. I'm happy to try, but I think um, I might just point point our our viewers to recordings that we already have on YouTube. So, so um, I said I guess I could probably share the link for the full performance of the Dana, Dana, Dana piano trio from last week as well. I shared the links um, for the clips, the very short clips that I had, and and those will be posted on Facebook, but. Um, yeah, so the performance we had last week, fully masked, um, was amazing. It was just so beautiful and uh, so happy to, to host it. And um, That performance included one of my favorites, too, even though it's not a contemporary one. The Clara Schumann Piano Trio is one that I, I really enjoy. Um, but some of my other kind of to spin off uh, Matt's question from earlier, some of my classical favorites um, that were written more recently um, Kivi mentioned the name of Carolyn Shaw. Her string quartet is one of my absolute favorite string quartets. I have yet to play in it. I would like to someday, but maybe, maybe someday. But uh, I really enjoy listening to it. Um, another composer um, that's doing great things even right now is uh, Jennifer Higdon. Um, and you might have even heard of the piece Blue Cathedral. It has been, I will, that, that piece won a Pulitzer Prize, am I right? That's right. I'm not positive. Regardless, it's still one of the most widely performed, I think, contemporary orchestral pieces. 
um, making kind of like the circuit right now. And then also her violin concerto. I know Hilary Hahn made a wonderful recording of that, and that's one of my favorite more modern pieces. But yeah. All right. Um, Kimberly Chapman says hi on Facebook. Hi, Kimberly. Thank you for tuning in. Um, all right. Well, if there aren't any other questions um, from any of our viewers tuning in, uh, is there anything else that either of you would like to say? Just, um, you know, the museum is open um, for visitors to come in and see the exhibitions with safety protocols in place. But uh, most of our, all of our programming, let's just say all of our programming is uh, virtual currently. So there will be, as we mentioned, a number of musical performances premiering on YouTube throughout the semester. And, um, you know, we'll just, um, we came back you know, uh, and, and put these together in a hurry because, you know, we came back in a hurry after being away from school for months. And um, so hopefully we can do some planning for next semester uh, to do some more um, musical performances, although we always have to wait and see what what this COVID situation will bring and whether we'll be able to have live performances or if we'll be continuing them virtually. And um, so, just keep checking in with us to see what's going on and uh, we'll make sure we get it out there, whether it's on our website or on our social media platforms. Kibi, anything in closing? I just want to encourage everyone who's watching to, um, to explore strange new sounds that you've never heard before. Um, it can be really fun. All right. Well, uh, everyone who's tuned in, thank you so much for joining us uh, for this session of the YSU Alumni Lecture Series. Special thanks again to Claudia Berlinski and Dr. Kivi Kahn-Lippman for joining us. Uh, also, thank you to Heather Belgian, the uh, Associate Director for Alumni Engagement, uh, who is in, helps us get all of these uh, lecture series together. And thank you to uh, Sharon Zembauer for being wonderful tech support this evening and helping get us helping get our live stream on the air. Uh, be sure to tune in next week uh, for the alumni uh, lecture series uh, for Dr. Joe Alessi, uh, a YSU alumnus from both 1990 and 1999, uh, and he will be discussing the first rule of leadership. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. Have a wonderful evening and stay healthy. Thank you, Brendan.